Rivington Pike from the Old English, Rivington Peak, meaning the village on the rough pointed hill, which is sort of accurate, if not a bit obvious. Where was I? Oh yes, Rivington Pike, leaving aside all the Rivington Village and other Rivington related stuff for this episode, has a Grade 2 listed tower on the top of it. There's a prehistoric barrow and a television transmitter on nearby Winter Hill as well, but we'll worry about them another time. The tower replaced one of a series of beacons built by the entertainingly named Ranulf de Blunderville circa 1139. This is proper history you're experiencing here. Get used to it, there's going to be a lot of it in this film. When the Lancastrian army was defeated near Clitheroe by some boisterous drunken Scots. Said beacon was later put to good use in 1588 to be exact, warning Lancastrians of the approaching Spanish Armada. Although what anybody was supposed to do about the situation we couldn't honestly say. Anyhow, the tower on Rivington Pike, which we couldn't actually reach because Jeannie McIntosh's Zimmer gave up and died about halfway to the door, was constructed as a hunting lodge using stones from the aforementioned Beacon's fire pit as the foundation. It was built by John Andrews of Rivington Hall, or more accurately, it was built by several blokes in the employ of John Andrews of Rivington Hall in 1733. So move forward a couple of years to 1904 and the author Ferguson Irvine. No, I've no idea who he was either, but let's just continue. Irvine claimed that Rivington Pike, the curious hobbacked mound which crowns the summit of the hill, and on which stands the beacon, shows signs of having at least been shaped by artificial means. And now you know why nobody's ever heard of the verbose git. Pull backwards again, we're not doing very well with the chronology this week, to 1801, and Rivington Pike served as a clandestine meeting place for a group of Republican activists, known as the United Englishmen, who ironically had to ask for assistance from the French for their ill-planned uprising. They became known as the Rivington Hill Rioters, a hyperbolic name as it turned out because, unfortunately for them, Rivington Pike wasn't clandestine enough and they all ended up arrested. Speaking of illegal movements, Rivington Pike took part, along with various other more infamous locations such as Kinder Scout, in the mass trespass of 1896, when 10,000 people from Bolton, why the residents of Bolton were so specifically wound up history doesn't record, trampled over a land belonging to aristocrats blocking their ancient rights of way. There's a memorial commemorating the 100th anniversary of the trespass on Culpit Road, which we also didn't get to, if anybody's interested. They're into towers around these parts, well, two of them at least. Not far from the Rivington Pike Tower stands the Pigeon Tower, also known as the Lookout Tower, and stroke or, depending on what sort of mood you're in, the Dovecote Tower. It was erected in 1905 as a birthday present for Lord Lever Hume's wife. Rumour had it that she actually wanted a Nintendo, but what can you do? It's got a back to front spiral staircase in it, which we didn't film because we weren't allowed inside. By back to front, we mean anti-clockwise. Medieval staircases generally ran clockwise to favour the right-handed swordsman defending the upper floors. Whoever designed the staircase in the Pigeon Tower was either unaware of this or just didn't care. Above the fireplace on the upper floor, which yet again we didn't film because we still weren't allowed inside, there's an inscription which reads simply Wheel, short for William Hesketh and Elizabeth Ellen Lever, presumably the stonemasons charged by the letter, followed by the Leverhume motto, I spurn the fear to change, ironically written as Muter vel temere sperno in Latin everybody's favourite long dead language. Both the Pigeon Tower and the Rivington Tower form part of the extensive terrace gardens, originally belonging to a spacious bungalow with ample parking and easy access to the shops, owned by Lord Leverhume, 
He owned a lot of stuff around Rivington, to be honest. If the name sounds familiar, he was one of the founder members of the Lever Brothers Company, nowadays known as Unilever. The bungalow was demolished in 1948. The gardens still exist, however, consisting of a pulmonite pond, don't ask, it's Japanese or something. Some stone summer houses in the Italian gardens, designed by Thomas Morton between 1905 and 1922, inspired by the Villa de Est near Rome, apparently. A man-made ravine, a seven-arched bridge which is based on Roman architecture and is actually quite impressive. Four lodge houses, footpaths, waterfalls, bridges, steps, I could go on but I don't want to because I'm losing the will to live. One of the buildings now lost to the ravages of history was Royton Cottage, a wooden structure destroyed in an arson attack in 1913 by Edith Rigby. Suffragette. On the other hand, Royton Cottage might just have been another name for the previously mentioned bungalow. I've lost track now. The artist, Alfred East, no we've never heard of him either to be honest, but he was the president of the Royal Society for British Artists, so he was probably quite good, stayed in Royton Cottage in 1909. Weaver commissioned a series of paintings of Rivington off him, then gave most of them away to the Bolton Art Gallery, the Walker Gallery in Liverpool and the Lady Lever Art Gallery at Port Sunlight, so now you know. On Winter Hill stands two cairns, known locally as the Two Lads Steady, we didn't reach them. I'm surprised Jeannie McIntosh made it as far as the Pigeon Tower, to be honest. Her head was a bit purple when we did. Anyhow, nobody knows what the Cairns are doing there, apart from gathering moss. But legend has it that long ago, two boys found themselves lost on Rivington Moors, as you do, and froze to death on the exact spot marked by the larger Cairn. Which makes you wonder what the smaller Cairn's doing there, but these old stone markers are always surrounded by mystery. A more expensive legend claims that the two lads were Saxon princes, who met the same untimely fate circa 680 AD. Yet another legend insists that they were the sons of Bishop Pilkington, no relation to Carl, who kicked the bucket circa 1540. While we're in this neck of the woods, worth a mention is Hole Bottom, if only because it sounds extremely childish and is just around the bend from the also extremely childish Two Lads. It's a pity they don't still produce carry-on films, the writers could get a good 20 minutes out of that. On which disappointing note, we've had enough. Obviously there's still a lot to cover with regards to Rivington yet, but we're out of space with this episode and our egg and chutney butties need eating up. Click like, leave a comment, subscribe, do whatever you like, just so long as you remember to join us for the next innuendo-laden episode of Lancashire Footnotes.